Okay, so it gives me great pleasure today to welcome uh, Nikki Stevens, who is based here at Oxford, where she's the Trapnell Fellow for African Environments at the Environmental Change Institute. Uh, Nikki completed her PhD at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and then worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And her research focuses on understanding global change impacts on African ecosystems, with a particular focus on savannas. And she's interested in understanding more about the consequences of woody encroachment and what shapes species range limits in disturbance-driven ecosystems. So thank you, Nikki, for agreeing to present, and uh, over to you. Thanks. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, hold on a moment. I was looking fine, Nikki. I was looking good. good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about woody encroachment, obviously. But this talk really is um, aiming to discuss it at a rather broad scale and sort of provide a bit of a synthesis. The focus of it is going to be on um, tropical grassy ecosystems, predominantly Africa, because that's where I've done most of my work. But where possible, I will try and extend our understanding, the understanding to other systems and apply it to other systems, because I think it's really relevant to many other systems. <clears throat> so certainly the world is getting warmer we understand that and we know that and obviously it's just, um, a lot of we receive a lot of attention about it um, but what comes with this understanding if you sort of were to ask a member an interested and relatively informed member of the public as to what they think would he, um, what they think warming is going to do to the world you get this sort of scenario where you expect the warmer world to be hot dry dead vegetation dead trees brown, filled with dying animals, and sort of this perspective of end times. And if we want to do something about it, a greener world looks better than a browner world. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, there's a huge focus in the scientific literature on tree mortality. And this also makes it through to um, the press. And it's a lot of, um, there's a lot of information about it, that warmer world is indeed resulting in tree death. And it certainly is. Um, this is a summary um, from IPCC in 2013 of where all tree death, climate change related tree death is occurring. Um, and it's recognized as a very real problem. But if you decide, well, let's maybe start here. If we decide to zoom into South Africa, or Southern Africa, there are a few incidences of tree death here. Arguably, they're not um, large scale mass mortality events. Maybe there's a bit of patch dieback here. But what you're seeing in these systems is quite the opposite. Um, if you take um, this picture here, this is shared with um, from, I think it's from Tim Hoffman. Um, the 1955, this fixed point photograph over here shows um, an open system, open savanna. This is in the eastern part of South Africa. Um, and by 2012, you've had a real big increase in the number of trees. Um, and over here, this is an aerial photograph. This is from Zululand, which is in the east of South Africa, known for its rolling grasslands. Um, in 1940, that's a really open system filled with um, grasses and a few scattered trees, maybe some trees in the drainage lines. But by 2011, the area has been completely changed and trees have invaded these systems. So much so, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving over here, so much so that um, large parts of these areas have actually been converted to completely closed systems. Um, and we've essentially lost the grassy component of these areas. So what's going on here? Traditionally, if you had to ask um, land managers or government po policy ad agricultural advisors, people would say, well, if your land's encroached, you're a bad manager. So are South Africans just really bad at managing their land and now we're we getting woody encroachment all over? Or is it a symptom of something else? So in the 1980s, um, woody encroachment was something that was um, recognized as a land management phenomenon and, and something um, that could be done through changing your land management strategy. So it could be land management, but what happens if you hold land management constant? 
So this is a study that um, looked at this. In the this is a study that's been measured from fire from fire treatment plots in the Kruger National Park in South African savannas. So there are several fire treatments that have been applied regularly at the same intervals, several different fire treatments, but they've been applied over 70 years. So these are the different treatments. This, the, the one year is that the area is burnt once a year um, in the dry season. The other treatment, the lighter, the lighter gray one, is the area is burnt every three years in the dry season. The other treatment is the area is burnt um, every three years, but in the wet season, so it's a cooler fire. Um, and what you notice is pretty much in these, in these semi-arid areas, nothing much changes. You get some differences but through the different management, you get some differences in the number of trees um, through these different um, land management actions, but you don't really see a significant change over time so much. But if you look in these music systems, what you notice in the 1950s and the 1970s, the number of trees stays relatively constant, maybe with some variability between the treatments. But in the 1990s, you get this incredible increase in the number of trees. Um, or so much so it's almost an order of magnitude um, increase. Um, so what happens in the 1990s? We've managed, the land management has remained absolutely constant. So this points to a driver other than that of land management that is causing this change. So this paper used this as evidence um, that elevated CO2 is driving some of these changes, but I will get back to that later. So moving on from this, state, this um, area, we've now just looked at a small area in Kruger National Park or several small areas in Kruger National Park. What happens if we look at the natural experiment that exists within South Africa? So to, to do this, we looked at how much encroachment had occurred in South Africa, but we used this um, mosaic of land management, um, land management scenarios that exist in this in the landscape. So there's lots of um, savanna that's not transformed, i.e. it hasn't been plowed up or had a city built on it, so it's still a natural vegetation. It's just utilized in different ways. And these are four common land management um, types that exist in these savannas. There's com commercial cattle ranches, as you can see, here's some cattle. Um, and what you would expect in these if land management was the driving force of tree cover trajectories over time would that you would be likely to get an increase in tree cover because cattle remove grass biomass and they facilitate tree establishment and they also prevent fires from occurring in the areas. But we also have these communal rangelands where lots of people live and they have some cattle but there's also a high density of goats. People rely on the um, natural resources in these areas so they remove the woody biomass by cutting it down, they use it for building, they use the wood for fuel, the goats eat the trees. So you really would expect a decline in tree cover over time. And certainly the literature points to this um, deforestation crisis in the communal rangelands in the 1980s, suggesting that woody cover in these areas is declining. Then we've got conservation areas with elephant, where you would expect that probably tree cover would remain a bit stable, potentially decrease over time because of the actions of elephants. And we've got conservation areas with no elephant. So there's fire, there's other herbivores, browsers and grazers, but no large elephants. So potentially you get a slight increase, but some variation in tree cover over time. So if you wanted to understand what woody cover is doing over time and local land use is the driving factor, you would expect a variety of changes in the trajectories depending on the land use. But if it's a global driver causing this change, you would expect a uniform increase. So if it's things like elevated CO2 or change in climate that is benefiting trees, you would expect tree cover to increase across all of these land managements. So what we saw, we divided these systems up into arid systems and the more arid savannas and the more mesic savannas. In the arid savannas, over time, we noticed that tree cover doubled across all of these land uses except when elephant were present. So the only land use that didn't experience a significant increase in, in tree cover was when elephants were present. This is pretty crazy, con considering that we're getting this massive increase in tree cover in communal rangelands, one of the areas you really wouldn't expect that. Um, but also the magnitude of increase in tree cover is also really huge. These arid systems are meant to be limited, um, really, like they're really limited by water. 
So the maximum amount of tree cover that can occur in these areas is fundamentally limited by water. Um, but in spite of that, we're still getting a doubling of tree cover over the past 70 years. And they're sitting, the tree cover is already sitting at, um, by 2010, sitting at about 40% tree cover, which is a really high threshold. Um, and it's, be, it's the threshold at which savannas sort of cease to function so well because they don't burn as well. And the system begins to collapse as a savanna at this state. Um, when we looked at this from mesic savannas, which are the wettest savannas, say about from 700 mils and above, um, we also noticed this phenomenal increase in tree cover. Um, also, again, an almost doubling of tree cover over the past 70 years. And what's really interesting is um, the presence of elephant in these systems, in the wetter systems, really didn't have that strong effect anymore. Even though that there are high, higher numbers of elephants, weren't as effective in um, preventing the um, woody encroachment. So this is a useful conclusion to point towards um, a global driver of woody cover change. And certainly the resilience of the system um, to change is being eroded by some larger scale force. So not only has tree cover doubled across many of the areas where trees already existed, but this study also shows that not only have you got this, but you've also got an increase in the extent of tree cover. So areas that were previously treeless or very sparsely tree have now expanded to get in a 20% increase in woodland extent over the past 23 years. It's also huge. So not only have you got more trees in certain areas, you've got an expansion of trees in areas where they weren't before. And this follows some very similar trends that you get an increase in trees extent in commercial rangelands, traditional rangelands, protected areas without elephants, and the only area where you had um, not really an expansion of woody cover or woodland is the areas where elephants occur. So elephants really are quite important and seem to be our, our one of our only one of our three tools in um, slowing woody encroachment. So this is just to bring home the reality of what I'm talking about. Um, this is what woody encroachment really looks like, and this is one of the things that why it's actually a issue or concern to talk about. Um, this picture is taken again in the eastern part of South Africa in sort of in the semi, at the, at the cusp of a semi-arid and a music savanna. This is in a commercial cattle ranch and I really, it's not a cherry picked photo that I had to look really hard for. Um, also large parts of Swaziland really just look like this. So you can see the green trees that are sort of in the background. Those are the trees that were probably been in the landscape before. And this gray shrub, it's actually Dicrostachus scenario, this, this is the encroaching species that has just filled up all these open spaces um, with this shrubbiness. And if, if when I was in this piece of land, it's a cattle ranch and it's almost impossible for the cattle to actually get into these areas. So when you drive around here, the only way you can, you have to stop and start all the time because all the cattle are standing on the roads because it's the last place for them to graze. So if we scale this up, what's happening, Not this is happening not only in South Africa, it's in fact happening across Africa. The amount of audio encroachment or increase in tree cover in Africa is huge. Um, on average, you have a 2.5% increase in tree cover per decade. And I've spoken about the extent of tree cover increase in South Africa. Um, over here, it's actually probably some of the lower, some of the areas that are experiencing the lower rates of encroachment compared to what's happening elsewhere. They've marked, uh, in this analysis, masked out forests. So you're really seeing um, an increase in tree cover for most parts. Obviously, there are patches of um, that are experiencing severe deforestation or degradation or removal of trees. But really, for the most part, you are noticing a really significant increase in tree cover. Um, and not only is it occurring across um, Africa, we noted that tree cover is occurring across, um, encroachment is occurring across all um, Africa, or all tropical savannas. And with the really significant amounts of woody encroachment occurring in the Cerrado, um, and the, these areas, um, so the blue dots highlight, the bigger the blue dot, the higher the rate of increase. Um, and in Africa, there are a few areas where tree cover has declined over time. Um, that does actually is often correlated with areas where elephants occur, not always, but often. Um, and Australia's savannas have experienced woody encroachment, but at a much lower level. So if we look 
that's quite a, there's quite a lot of encroachment occurring in savannas. So I think it's a useful um, conclusion to draw from this. Um, and if we wanted to expand this to the rest of the world, well, it's certainly something that's synonymous with North American rangelands. Um, again, this is, this is again across the amount of woody cover increase per year across a rainfall gradient for different um, North American woodlands, rangelands, and certainly occurring fairly widely in North America. And if we have to look at the scale of the world, well, I put this in perspective, tree death is certainly a pro problem. It seems to be restricted to many forested areas, um, not exclusively, but largely. But um, if you look, this, look at this in perspective, um, you're also getting many, many, many of these open areas across the world being invaded by trees and an increase in tree cover. So they're not necessarily grassy systems, but most of them are grassy systems. So the next question is, well, why? Um, what is causing these changes? And it's quite a complex problem. I mean, each change in itself is quite a simple. Each of the drivers themselves are quite simple, but it is a, com a system of inter 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 interacting processes that are causing these changes. So one of the first um, culprits um, of causing these changes is changing fire regime. This is a picture from these fire plots in the Kruger National Park that I spoke about. The red one has been burnt every year for the past 70 years or so. And you can see there's a relatively low amount of tree cover. The blue square shows an area where fire has been excluded for the past 70 years. And you really have a large increase in the woody cover of these systems. If you look at um, this plotted out in a graph, these are the different um, fire treatments in the Kruger National Park plotted against rainfall. So these are the driest ones. This is where fire was excluded. So the black bar shows where fire is excluded and what the biomass is and what the biomass is where fire has been excluded. And when it's really dry and you remove fire from the system, you get a moderate increase in woody cover. But as it gets wetter, and you exclude fire, the effects are much more compelling and much more clear that you really start getting a significant increase in woody cover when you start suppressing fires in these systems. So this is in the Kruger National Park. Um, no, sorry. So what, why this happens basically is the longer the intervals you have between fires, the easier it is for trees to grow to fireproof sizes. So if you have a very regular fire, the saplings that are growing in the grass layer get burnt and they get burnt back and they have to start again. They really sprout and they're small, and then they have to, they get hit back by the next fire, and they basically become stuck in the trap. But if you have a longer interval between fires, it's easy for trees to escape. And if they can get to a certain threshold height, they can resist fires. And a surface grass fire is not really much of a problem for uh, adult savanna. So if we take the story for the Kruger National Park and we extend it for other systems, for other grassy systems, um, this is again organized by rainfall. If you have um, fire excluded and the rainfall increases, again, you have a really significant impact on um, increasing woody biomass. So certainly removing fire or slowing the, or re reducing the return interval of fire has the potential to increase the woody biomass. So is this just an individual problem? Well, certainly um, grass ecosystems themselves have very frequent fires. This is just a map of fire return interval across the world. And if you look at the reds and the oranges, um, obviously they're not all, but these sort of indicate a good give you a good indication of where the grassy ecosystems of the world are. And if you look at this map, this looks at the burnt area trend per year over time. So if um, the area is colored in blue, um, it indicates that you're having a decline in the burnt area per year. So basically, there's a negative trend in the um, amount of burnt area. So these areas that are highlighted in blue or blue dots are burning frequently and quite strongly with many of the grassy systems of the world. Not all, again, and certainly um, some of the other areas, non-grassy systems are experiencing a, a notable increase in the amount of burning. But these grassy systems in general are burning less frequently than they used to. So that is one of the drivers that we um, explain some of these changes and really have increases. So why are we getting fewer fires? Well, certainly from an African perspective, we're getting fewer fires because of landscape fragmentation. 
um, we have more people living in these systems. Um, that does that that may mean that there more there may be more ignitions, but um, the fragmented state of the system means that fires don't spread as well and fewer areas are burnt. Also, have the amount uh, um, increase in crop cropland, which is really not a uh, land use that's um, friendly to fire. Um, and we have a heavy cattle density. Cattle eat grass, which is the fuel for fire, so that reduces the amount of fire in the system. So you have fewer fires. These increase the amount of body biomass, but it results in a positive feedback loop because the more body biomass you have, the less likely you are to have more fires. Because when you get tree cover, as tree cover increases, the, percent, the amount of burnt area decreases. And it hits this really strong threshold at around 40% tree cover. And um, the system doesn't support a fire so well anymore, primarily because the trees shade up grasses and reduce the amount of fuel, making it more difficult for fire to spread in these systems. So you have this feedback loop. So really, once tree cover is hitting about 40%, you really have a strong erosion of ecosystem processes that maintain savannas. And if you think back to some of the graphs I showed you about the extent of encroachment in South Africa, um, tree cover is already sitting about at about 40% in many of these systems. Um, so yeah, so where, where is this likely to be the biggest impact? Well, fire suppression is really likely to have a big area impact in these more music systems where fire frequency is quite high or used to be quite high, and tree regrowth is quite fast, to giving trees a better opportunity to escape. So the other thing that's important in um, affecting encroachment is the amount of grazing. So sustained heavy grazing is an important um, tool or important process that results in woody encroachment. Heavy grazing results in less grass biomass. Less grass means there's less competition with trees, making it easier for trees and seedlings to establish. And it also has the benefit of reducing fire frequency. This is just an example of an area where grazers have been excluded um, and where grazers are present and certainly grazers remove grass. Um, this is just a, an example um, of the top graph over here. This is the change in tree height, so tree growth over time. Obviously, trees grow much better if there's less grass to compete with, and you get a notable increase in the amount of grass, uh, in the amount of tree growth. The bottom graph is actually really useful because it allows us to understand where grass competition is a problem. So in the really arid systems, grasses actually benefit trees. They allow offer trees some shade, keeps the area a little bit cooler for seedlings to establish. But as soon as you reach a threshold of about 400 mils or so, the presence of grass um, become negative and more grasses then act as competitors for trees. And this graph, this graph shows it really nicely. It's really interesting. It shows it's a really strong relationship in temperate grassland systems as well. So if you're grazing a system and you're removing this grass competition from quite a quite a arid system, um, the presence of um, cattle can actually result, or presence of sustained heavy grazing can actually result in um, or improve tree establishment and result in encroachment. So is this relevant for at the continental scale? Certainly. This is a, um, a map that shows the historical levels of woody, um, of cattle, or of herbivore biomass and how they've changed over time. In about the past 70 years or so, um, anywhere that's green or yellow shows a decline in the amount of herbivore biomass, and that certainly has happened. But what's really interesting is if you look at this graph over here on the side, if you look at the red graph, um, the red box, that's the amount, that's the only um, herbivore class that's increased in biomass, and that represents cattle. So you've had a decline in grazers, you've had a decline in mixed feeders, you've had a decline in browsers, and this has really been replaced by the presence of the large grazer of cow. And if you look at this from a global perspective, there's a huge amount of cattle across the world and really they're concentrate, they're really concentrated in the grassy ecosystems. So what's the impact here? Well, the biggest likely impact is semi-arid and music grasslands um, where grass biomass inhibits growth. So the, the wetter systems, um, if cattle can remove the grass, they really give trees a benefit. On the other hand, browsers can slow woody encroachment. Um, this is a series of pictures from Lisa Bucker, um, which shows that if you remove browsers from the system, trees can establish and um, where they otherwise couldn't. And of course, browsers are important because they remove tree biomass, they reduce seed production, they remove seedlings, and they prevent the transition to recruiting adults. 
Um, this is just a, this is quite a nice example, this um, graph. This shows over time um, the change in tree growth um, in an area where browsers were present when the white blocks um, and versus an area where browsers were absent in the gray blocks. And if browsers are absent, trees grow much better. Um, again, not a huge surprise. Um, the impact of browsers is amplified, however, if mega herbivores exist in the system. Um, so mega herbivores are particularly effective at removing biomass, but they also have the added advantage that they can open up previously closed areas. Um, this is quite a nice study here um, by Andrew Davies, which looks at the above ground biomass over time, converted it to carbon values. And if you have herbivores present, um, Oh, sorry, it's not over time, it's between two different exposures. So if you have herbivores, you have um, if you have no herbivores, you have a fairly high biomass. If you have um, browsers and herbivores but no elephants, you get a slight decline in the um, above ground biomass. But as soon as you add elephants, you really get a notable decline in the amount of above ground biomass. But what's important to notice is that this effect is much stronger in the current system. And we that's sort of reflected in what we've seen in the encroachment results. So that's important at the global scale. Mega herbivores certainly matter. Africa is one of the last, one of the systems where mega herbivores still exist. But increasingly, these mega herbivores are confined to protected patches of protected areas, and they're not really popular. I mean, if you have a conservation area and you decide to have elephants in, it's not something that your neighbors are going to relish because elephants are a bit pesky and they break things and they're not really cherished by everybody. So the presence of mega herbivores across these systems are really increasingly confined to um, just a few areas. So their ecosystem processes and ecosystem value is really declining. And yeah, they certainly have an important role to play with in reducing encroachment. So where is tree growth um, likely to be inhibited by browsers? Well, certainly their browsers inhibit tree growth everywhere, but they really have a particularly important role where tree growth is already quite slow. So temperature limited systems, water limited systems, or systems where nutrient limitation exists, because um, the compensatory regrowth after browsing is quite slow, giving browsers an opportunity for tree to eat the trees again and keep them short. Um, whereas if they're not limited at all, they can grow quite quickly and escape the browser trap. So now we're going to get onto climate change. I'm just going to gloss over this a little bit with terms of rainfall and the climate. Um, if you get an increase or change in rainfall, this is certainly important. It's really important for arids, for African savannas, where rainfall is the primary limitation. We certainly know that encroachment rates increase. The weight of the system, the higher the rate of encroachment. Um, this is also important to note that if you have an increase in rainfall, you're also going to get an increase in grass biomass. So it's not a straightforward relationship. Um, what the trends are, we, what we expect is uncertain. Um, we may expect more rainfall in some areas. We may expect an increase in rainfall intensity, but not necessarily an increase in the mean annual precipitation. And this is important because these have different qualities for the amount of encouragement. Um, and of course, this is something that you can see in the Sahel, where you're getting an increase in rainfall over the past recent or past few years, and you're getting an increase in tree cover and grass cover. Um, in terms of climate change and warming, well, certainly the world is getting warmer um, and we can draw on experimental warming to try and understand what some of these impacts are. Um, and we can see this is quite a complicated graph, but if you just focus on herbaceous and woody biomass um, changes, if you warm these systems, if you warm woody plants, they actually grow better. Um, these are experimental conditions where water and nutrients are not necessarily limiting, but if um, things are warmed and they can grow otherwise, they don't, they don't suffer too much. And the same for grass biomass, um, herbaceous biomass. Herbaceous biomass generally performs better if it's warmed. Um, of course, this, limit, this um, holds true if you're in a cold system, so it seems. So, the change of biomass um, is going to be much greater if you're released from your limitation um, of temperature. And this benefit decreases as the system gets warmer. But it's also important to note, bearing in mind that we're talking about savanna systems, there are extraordinarily few warming experiments in Southern Hemisphere savanna systems. 
And from this huge meta-analysis, there are only three experiments, I think, um, maybe even two, where um, C4 grassy systems are actually included. So actually, there's a huge gap in our understanding of warming in savannas. Certainly, we know that warming in the Northern Hemisphere results in more trees. It's certainly responsible for increasing tree cover and extending tree lines. Um, and it's also widely um, pointed to the driver of woody encroachment in the tundra. What happens in savannas? Well, actually, it's quite hard to say. Um, arid savannas particularly fall into a climate change hotspot where if the world was to increase by 1.5 degrees te in temperature, these systems are predicted to increase by four to six degrees in temperature. Um, and it's widely assumed this is going to result in more tree death. But it really depends on the interaction with drought. There's been this phenomenon of these hot droughts. So you have a drought during the growing, during summer um, where it's really, really hot and really, really dry, which does result in tree death. But the other things like warming can help plants escape the frost trap. A lot of Africa actually experiences a lot of frost, these, especially like some of the, high, the highest um, interior savannas and woodlands. Um, so warming can help trees escape the frost trap and also enhance seedling establishment and it has the potential to alter tree grass interactions. Um, but I don't, I'm not fully, I'm just, I don't fully understand how and I think there's a lot of thoughts to be understood in this area still. Um, in terms of elevated CO2, well, it's well understood that elevated CO2 can increase biomass production from carbon fertilization. It's also understood that the fertilization effect is limited if there's water limitation, nutrient limitation, and temperature limitation. But um, carbon um, fertilization is very relevant in disturbance-driven systems because it helps trees escape um, the disturbance trap. Um, this is a picture from a paper by Bobby Hawke and William Bond, where they grew trees, and actually, incidentally, a woody encroaching tree and different elevated CO2 or different carbon dioxide concentrations. If you take it to early um, pre-glacial numbers, 180 ppm, really low carbon dioxide results in a very minuscule amount of investment in root biomass. But as you increase the amount of carbon dioxide, you get a really notable increase in the amount of root biomass. This is particularly relevant because these trees rely on re-sprouting to survive in disturbance. This is the results from the same experiment that um, as you increase the amount of biomass, the amount of the amount of resprouting shoot um, increases. And if you look at that, if you think about this, it means that these trees are able to grow more quickly out of the fire trap when the elevate when carbon dioxide levels are higher. Um, and this this line over here indicates a threshold at which trees become fire resistant. So. More CO2 means that you are investing more below ground, which means that you are better re-sprouter, which means you are better at dealing with disturbance and surviving in this new world. It's also really important to note that it means that trees um, are more resilient to disturbance. So if you were burnt 100 years ago, it would take you much longer to recover, whereas if you're burnt now, um, you're much more resilient and you can recover much quicker. And what's also important to note, elevated CO2 improves the water use efficiency, and this may be very relevant for plants and arid ecosystems. So there is a lot of work that's been done on elevated CO2, but there are not a lot of experiments that have been done in savannah ecosystems. Um, Will Hoffman did a really nice one in 2000, and there were some that have been done in the, on the one experiment that I just showed you. Um, but there are a lot of big gaps still. What, like, how, what's the interaction of trees and grasses under elevated CO2, specifically C4 tree, uh, trees and C4 grasses with savanna trees? What are the plant traits that make trees more responsive to CO2? And how does this interact with drought, especially that these systems are likely to experience drought? And how does it interact with warming? Um, there's an elevated CO2 facility that's been established in South Africa recently, which hopefully will um, start answering some of these big gaps. Um, yeah, so then the other thing, so I've sort of discussed some of the ecological drivers, but there's also this cultural um, impression that really has, could also be responsible for some of these changes that we see and may result in mismanagement of some of our grassy ecosystems. 
This is understanding that many open e grassy ecosystems exist where, for, where, where are climatically suitable for forests. So this has been termed ecosystem uncertain, um, this paper from William Bond, um, which shows that many of the ecosystems in the world have the climate that allows closed canopy systems to form, but um, in fact remain open due to the actions of disturbance. So this really is savannas and grasslands um, are open, but they could have a forest growing in otherwise. The problem with that is um, you think about tropical biomes, the colonial legacy has had a really big impact because colonists arrive in Africa, they see these large amounts of areas where it seems that forests grow quite well and they're open. And the assumption was all these systems are degraded and deforested and they need to be fixed. Um, and disturbance was really perceived as very negative. So, I mean, this isn't a very nice quote that shows what the Dutch administrators in um, the Cape Colony proposed, that if you were caught burning a felt, this your, it was your second offense, your punishment would be death by hanging. Quite extreme, but they were quite serious about this, that they really did not want disturbance and their fire was really viewed as a really negative thing. And um, it, these systems were viewed as really degraded. And um, this has also been a narrative that's quite pervasive in the Sahel. Um, and it's also been interesting to see that this drought, the system of drought and vegetation dieback that's inherent in these semi-arid systems is often perceived as degradation and desertification to be fixed by greener. Um, similarly, there's a very interesting um, narrative in tropical and temperate grasslands. And I don't really, I'm not really an expert in temperate grasslands, but it also is really striking is that there's this assumption that the natural state of vegetation in Europe is continuous closed forest, but patches of grassland in areas that are in really shallow soils or high up in the mountain or maybe a wetland. And the presence of grassland in systems that could otherwise support forest must be man-made. Yet many of these grasslands themselves have a really high diversity and endings. And I found a really nice paper that actually uses the pollen record to um, look at grasslands in Europe and suggests that these primary grasslands, um, top two are the type of grasses that occur where forests can occur, have always been a very common phenomenon across time. And yes, there has been an increase in the number of grasslands because of um, human activities recently where trees have been cut down, but that's near and part of the landscape and are equally important and ancient and diverse. But there's a strong narrative that actually, if you see a grassland, they are in fact semi-natural. So that inherently, also, that also really um, works to degrade the sort of value of these systems and um, how the level of care that people put into conserving them and protecting them and managing them. Anyway, so the next point would be to discuss what is actually the point um, do we care about woody encroachment? Um, so if we have widespread woody encroachment, what are the effects on the system? Um, so I thought I would start talking about biodiversity. And the first element of biodiversity, the obvious one is structure. Um, and if you have an increase in woody cover and you have this woody encroachment, it seems to be that you really get the structural homogenization. And again, I draw you back to this picture. Your system really is just one very homogenous, thickety, thorny mess. And that really reduces the number of available habitats for many other species. Um, There's a study that was also done in the Creek National Park that shows that when you have an increase in woody cover, you get fewer grazers. So this is an example of zebras. So the number of zebras decline. These are the two lines represented on different, um, represent zebra numbers on different geological types. But you have fewer, more trees means less grazers. And this holds true for many other grazers. So you have sable, wildebeest, decibe, elant. They all um, exhibit similar trends. So more tree cover, they fall out of the system or they don't occur there. Um, unlike that, unlike grazers, browsers benefit. So the more browser, the more trees you have in the system, browsers benefit and you get more browsers. So this is true for impala. Um, things like Nyala, Kudu, and Giraffe all increase in number when you get more trees. 
I mean, this is also true for all animal species that you really, they really affected the community composition is really affected by tree cover. So the more trees you have in the system, um, you get this di different diversity of um, animals. So the small carnivore communities are really impacted. Um, they start changing as you increase tree cover, some increase and then decline, some exhibit a really strong decline. But what's really interesting is um, all of these are experiencing a negative trend in abundance, but by the time you get to these really high tree covers and shrub covers, and for much of the savannas in Africa, we are already sitting at really high shrub covers. So this is really having a severe impact on diversity. Um, like, like large mammals, um, rodent communities are also affected. So you get a decline in rodent abundance. You get a change in species in terms of spiders, grasshoppers, beetles, um, some responses by lizards, really notable shifts in bird community structure. This is a study where they did some species richness and some bird surveys in 1998. They went back to the area again to, in, 10 years later and it had experienced significant encroachment. So they had a really nice opportunity to measure the change and you got a change in species richness, but you also really got a clear change in the type of birds that were occurring in these areas. So there was a notable loss of the larger bodied non-passerine birds, like the game birds, um, a decline in ground forages, a decline in seed eaters, and an increase in smaller bodied insectiv insectivorous passerines. This was also, the, I found a study recently um, about in, in North America, where you get an increase in woody cover you really get an increase in non-grassland birds. But what really is interesting is you get this really strong negative impact on these grassland species. So if you look at the metrics in terms of species richness, you're not necessarily picking up the worrying trend. But if you look at these individual functional groups, we're losing these open system species, these systems that are species that are dependent on open systems. And this is likely to be occurring everywhere um, where there's grassland systems. And of course, the other thing is, how does this affect people? This, these systems are experiencing really um, big changes and certainly altering the ecosystem services. I mean, there's some very nice studies that show that the more encroachment you get, um, the less littered, the slower the decomposition is. Um, you also show that um, things like carrion removal decreases, um, amount of ticks increase. Um, but one of the very obvious ones is what happens to the grass biomass. When you have more trees growing in the system, in these savannas, the trees shade out the grasses, which means that you get less grass and a decline in grass cover. Basically, it's grass cover declines to the point that you really have no grasses. And there's a really nice study done in 2014 by Anadin, who looked in North America and in Argentina range, rangelands and worked out that for every 1% increase in tree cover, you're basically getting a decline of one cow per kilometer squared, which is really quite significant. And um, we've also spent some time interviewing people, um, asking them what are the impacts of encroachment to their livelihoods. Bearing in mind, many of these encroach systems occur in rangelands, uh, communal rangelands, where people rely on the land to survive and buffer. These are really important buffers for poverty. And these are some of the quotes, and, and they pulled out some of the really interesting ones. People find woody encroachment very frightening. It it's increases the fear of the landscape. Um, robbers hide in the bush. And um, some of the quotes are, we can no longer walk through the fields because there are too many trees and it's dangerous. If you're living in an area that's um, not hugely transformed, um, you also have predators hiding in these bushes. These thick areas hide wild animals, such as leopard. Um, other people say there's nothing inherently wrong with these trees, but having a lot of trees uses more water. Sometimes people say we need to cut down trees to get more water into the landscape. These trees kill grass and our livestock is life. So um, I put some links into the at the end of this um, where we've actually gone and interviewed some and you can see some of the interviews of what some of these people are saying. A really interesting one, I mean, also quite obvious, is that more trees that you're having in the system, they're also using more water. Um, and certainly they're probably drawing more water from deeper levels. But there's this really nice study that was done in the Cerrado, which shows that when you have encroachment, the number of trees increases the amount of interception. So 
the increase in leaf material basically that's occurring on the leaves captures more of the rainfall that stays on the leaf and then it gets evaporated. So for every one, um, for every increase in the unit of total basal area, you're getting 1% decline in the amount of rainfall reaching the ground. And for arid systems and semi-arid systems, this actually works out to be a significant proportion of rainfall that's not entering the system. Um, and again, quite something quite serious. There's also a really nice study that also highlights, just sort of gives you a sense of how important um, not having encroachment in your system is. And they worked out the economic value of ecosystem services derived from restoring land that had been impacted by encroachment. And the paper is done by William Stafford and it's um, worth looking at. And they worked out that the increase in the amount of water, i.e. the amount of water that's being increased in the catchments and the increase in grazing um, results in yeah, hundred, hundreds to thousands of millions of dollars um, to the country. Charcoal, incidentally, um, much of the charcoal that is sold to Sainsbury's in the UK comes from bush encroachment in Namibia. Um, and it's a, it's a very useful side effect from clearing woody encroachment. So these, so if you clear and you restore trees, um, you are you can sell these products and you can make a lot of money from this, um, which adds some ecosystem services and benefits. So clearing woody encroachment offers a lot of value in terms of charcoal, also in firewood. Similarly for South Africa, you really increase. Um, there is a lot of value from clearing woody encroachment, and you get a lot of value back in your land by not having this. Um, in this analysis, they included a lot of estimates that could be done. They could they could use woody encroachment for if you if you could use it towards fuel or an, a sustainable biomass. Although that technology has not been, I mean, the technology exists, but it hasn't been commercialized at that scale yet. So I didn't include those numbers yet. But nonetheless, restoring your system is really valuable, and woody encroachment really is having some severe negative effects on ecosystem services. So I can point to all of these studies and you know, talk about encroachment and what causes it. But one of the things is, does it really matter at the scale? And I mean, that is something that's worth thinking about. Um, it really seems that we're having a global decline in grassy space. We recognize that grasslands have been converted through um, establishment of farms and forestry. But the grassy systems that exist that we feel are safe because they're in conservation areas or because we can see them really are not so safe because they're really slowly being eroded before our eyes because woody encroachment happens at a rate that's quite slow and it probably happens at a rate just longer than human memory or longer than a human life. And we're not really appreciating the scale at which this is occurring. But certainly if you're getting this global decline in grassy spaces, you're really losing unique and endemic flora and fauna that are adapted to urban ecosystems. What about the invasion of drylands with woody cover has the potential to alter earth, atmosphere, earth system feedbacks and altering albedo, which can also result in warming by having an otherwise grassy system covered with dark trees. Um, grassy systems are also really important below ground store for carbon. Some indications that grasses are really good at facilitating the transfer of, of carbon to below ground carbon. So you have a grassy system, there's a really good chance that it's got a higher below ground carbon value. Um, also into going into the future, given, a, given that it's a hotter, warmer world, it's a really safe store of below ground carbon. It's protected from drought and it's protected from fire. So what is happening when you start losing all of these systems? Especially if you're thinking from a dryland perspective, 40% of the Earth's area. Um, what about water security? You're having trees, the less rainfall is reaching the ground. The trees are also using the water in the system. Um, they're reducing the amount of water that's reaching the water table. What about water security and how this is affecting people who live in the, these areas? And also, is this affecting the intensity of droughts into the future? If you have a drought in an arid system or a dryland, there's already um, less water in the systems if it's severely encroached. So yeah, so I mean, I think there's things to think about here. And I think it's really important to start recognizing that encroachment is degradation. When people hear our work on woody encroachment, often people say to me, oh, that's fantastic, nature's healing herself. 
No, it's certainly not. It's degradation. Um, ecosystem services are being eroded. Um, but it also highlights some of the narrative that we really confronted with all the time to rethink the idea that greening is good and um, planting trees is going to solve your problems. Um, but also the um, story of woody encroachment offers us some really important lessons to be learned on the problems with planting trees and grassy biomes. Um, in terms of conservation, well, conservation areas are the last, viewed as the last safe outposts of open areas. And this is true for areas where mega herbivores exist, but in many areas you have grassland reserves and a lot of the processes that grasslands have disappeared or are being eroded over time. It's important to recognize that disturbance is good. This is really an unpopular narrative with the public. People don't like fires. People don't like elephants coming in and destroying trees. Also important to recognize that climate change in drylands does not mean that drylands are going to be necessarily desertified. Um, it's also important to recognize that removing trees can be a valuable restoration approach. It's usually a popular idea. <laughs> um, and management of this problem, I think it's really important to look for opportunities to manage change um, and look for opportunities like supplying charcoal to Sainsbury's with a woody encroachment product. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities in this. And again, I think what's important, there's some really important lessons that can be learned from the forest community um, who came together as a community to make some real difference in forest conservation. I mean, just look at the Amazon. Um, they've really done an amazing job of highlighting the plight of the Amazon. And I think the grassland community have some important lessons to come together and really start tackling some of this misinformation and highlight the conservation needs for these grassy systems. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Great. Uh, okay, do you want to stop sharing, Nikki? We can, we can open yes, up. Yes, There uh, we go. To uh, questions. So, so to, as I said, everyone, feel either pop your question into the chat or just indicate that you'd like to ask a, a question. And then I can either invite you to directly present to Nikki if you're, if you're willing to, uh, to do that. Okay, uh, well, while we're waiting for, uh, there's one in there, but while we're waiting for other questions to, to pop in, uh, I'll just kick off Nikki. Uh, so what you've described is a quite compelling evidence of this being a global phenomenon driven by macro scale drivers, whether CO2 or warming temperatures and things. Uh, and uh, so my question there is, is, this, uh, is there much we can do in terms of large scale interventions, clearly locally, there's, there's a need for education in terms of the value of open systems, that there, there could be actions that could be done, like introducing elephants in places where they're at lower densities, etc. cetera. Uh, but are we really putting the fingers in the dike of this sort of flood of encroachment that's happening because, because of much larger scale processes that require a much larger scale uh, to dealing with atmospheric change to address? I think if we if we looked if we were looking at like alpine grasslands where tree lines are expanding tree lines are expanding because of warming and there's really not much we can do we can try and save them and we can translocate some species or whatever but i think the opportunities in these ecosystems uncertain are actually quite wide and varied because we have the opportunity to manage these systems with fire and herbivory so rather than it's just an inevitable approach where we really can't do anything about it, we do have these options. I mean, we are getting some better understanding. You know, we can burn more frequently um, or we can burn with higher intensity to try and counteract some of these effects. So I think for many of these uncertain ecosystems and these disturbance-driven systems, Kef, we, need, we need to make some decisions what we want the system to look like. And we do have some options of sending them sending in the way that we would like to that said there's some really interesting work that's looked at clearing and when you reach a threshold of encroachment it's really difficult to switch the system back i mean it's a regime shift so i mean i think it's also important to decide to act sooner than later great thank you okay uh, natalia can tell us you have a question would you like to ask it uh, sure. Um, well, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. So I know that you work in um, 
in Africa, but um, while I was looking at your um, global maps, um, so I'm mostly interested um, in the in South America, and so there is a, there is a lot of literature about um, these drier these species which are more drought resistant, um, kind of invading um, areas where it used to be moist forest. Right, and I was wondering if you know, like the, and they're coming from, like, of course, um, the Cerrado or the Catinga, right? And I was wondering if you know this, um, this shift, this encroachment, could be accelerating, you know, that shift on these ecotonal areas. I don't know if you know anything about that. And as, as I, I don't know anything about that. I, I am aware that I can tropical rainforests, you're getting the shift towards drought tolerant species. But what's actually interesting is, actually I think it's documented in the Cerrado that forests in fact invading um, Cerrado rather than the opposite. Oh. So it's, I think that's a community shift that's occurring within the biome rather than from coming from outside the biome. But I stand to be corrected because I'm not really an expert in that at all. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks Natalia. Okay, Jill Petrakovsky has a question. She hasn't got a microphone, so I'll read it out. And she asks, uh, do you think this additional woody biomass will reverse the trend by local communities of using modern energy cooking systems and fuels with knock-on health impacts? Are people going to start using biomass fuel more because there is more wood fuel available? So uh, there's some useful case studies that have been done uh, from some communal regions in South Africa um, electricity is expensive, um, so people tend to still use woody biomass fuel anyway. Um, so, and but the problem with woody encroachment often is it's actually not great for it's not a great fuel wood because it's quite thin, um, so it's very shrubby. So it does offer fuel, but it's not it's not it's not phenomenal fuel wood. Um, but people are using it and biomass burning is very common, certainly in, in the poorer households, because then you don't need to have an electricity bill. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Jan, would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you so much um, for the really amazing talk. I was wondering, um, in Europe, people sort of talk about planting trees from the perspective of retaining water in the landscape and um, and also kind of creating more of underground carbon storage. Um, and I was just wondering whether there's like comparative studies on in which specific um, landscapes or, or areas there is benefit or drawbacks to either woody or grassy um, biomes. Apologies if this is a bit broad. Um, I'm still getting my head around that literature, but uh, it seems that, you know, once you cross a threshold of moisture and aridity, so you can have high rainfall area, but it's a, it's um, high, evaporation, high evaporative demand. But if you sit in a moist area that is quite humid, when you cross a threshold, then trees can enhance the amount of water in the system. I mean, that, that is certainly the case. Trees can certainly enhance the amount of water in the system. And if you have forest, they can increase the rainfall in the area. Um, but it does depend on your climatic context. And I think that's the most important. Again, not an expert for sure. <laughs> uh, while we're on the topic of our below, below ground carbon and carbon stocks, so I was wondering your point that you made that grassy systems tend to have high below ground, both biomass and carbon stocks because of the root activity. Uh, but if, you, if, a grand, if a grassy system gets encroached by, by a woody system, how much of that below ground carbon is, is vulnerable? I mean, does it get released or is it the legacy carbon that, that will persist there while the above ground carbon also builds up? I think, so I've been thinking about this. I think the one thing is there's fewer grasses and the grasses seem to be key. Grasses are really good at sequestering below ground carbon um, it's because they break down quickly, they go, they're rapidly absorbed into the soil. So that's important that you have fewer grasses into the system. And then woody encroachment, again, can or cannot, but may reduce the diversity in these systems. And a lot of the diversity is in these, under, these plants that have underground storage organs. 
and so there's a lot of carbon there. But I think the most important thing is the lack of grass and the less grass who are the main agents of getting that carbon down. Mm. I, I guess my question was uh, the, how much of that carbon that's down there, if these grasslands are ancient, and how much of that carbon is so old and sort of non labile that turning into a woody system wouldn't wouldn't change that store of carbon and suddenly have it released out of the atmosphere. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wonder that. I mean, if you imagine if you plow it up, sure. And if you planted trees in there, I would imagine it would. But yeah, I, I don't know, actually. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. OK, some more questions. Uh, Sanish, you have a question? You there, Sanish? If not, I, I can read it out. Uh, uh, it's, it's about, uh, you might be able to see it, uh, Nikki. Sim, Simba Pogon is benefiting from no fire, no harvest. Uh, I don't know if you have a comment on that, really. Uh, it's a, not a question, really. It's something. Uh, air trees are not, not benefit, are not benefiting from no fire situation. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends what you want. I mean, some simple pogan is completely unpalatable, but it does, it's, it does need fire to burn, to get rid of it. Um, yeah, I so hear trees are not benefiting from no fire. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. What yeah, no, no problem. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Anand Madhavi, uh, do you have a comment? Do you want to, you want to make your comment directly? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm I'm in Nairobi, and I, I read an article a few weeks ago that made me kind of come short about deforestation and savannas. But it was basically saying um, savannas in Africa are under threat because of for, uh, reforestation. And I, I kind of double took it. And I was just thinking, um, like I, I do understand like the complexity and the nuances of this but you might have to be quite careful about educating people about savannas. It's, it's, a, it's really true. Um, if, you if you think about what average person knows what they from school, they know planting tree is a really good thing and forests are declining and being deforested and cut down all over the world. So you don't want to undo that good, right? But um, one of the biggest threats to savannah systems is people wanting to plow it up and plant trees and then it's really bad. Um, and how you find the subtlety, subtlety around that is, is difficult. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a challenge. And, but I, I think it's a challenge we have to tackle because I think it's a real problem that Savannah's face. And especially even just referring to deforestation, cutting down, I mean, I even do it, but cutting down trees and savannas, um, it's, it's, you know, the, people then automatically think the savannas are forest you know it's, it's just these subtleties that really change people's perceptions and again also in terms of caring for woody encroachment I feel like there's also nuance that you need to make there I'm not saying that you should cut down every single tree and remove all the trees but you should leave one or two trees you should leave some trees but again it's all this this nuance which is hellish to put out to the public right yeah <laughs> but I do I, think I, we need to take the challenge on yeah, and I wondered as well, I think maybe the Southern Africa perspective, a bit like with the hunting poaching thing, it may be a slightly different take that's needed in East Africa or slightly different issues. So I was looking at your map and looking at, okay, Somalia, Kenya, big charcoal problems, Madagascar, huge deforestation. And so this, this simple narrative might need like a few different branches, branches depending on where it's being tar targeted, I guess. Yeah, I mean, even some of the deforestation, sorry, charcoal production, woody encroachment is still occurring in these places, but some of the bigger trees, the lot, there's a loss of large trees and a replacement of these shrubby trees. Whereas Somalia, some of the native, you know, some of that's actually thicket vegetation already. Yeah, it, it does require subtlety. I don't know how to address it though, but it needs to be done. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, Elias, would you like to ask your question? I can't hear anything. I've, I've just read your question, Elias. I, I can't hear you. 
You were okay. talking I'll, about. I'll, I'll read out the question. And, and, uh, okay. So Ellis asks uh, if carbon fertilization is one of the main drivers of woody encroachment in southern African savannas, can costly and environmentally questionable management approaches, such as aerial spraying, have any positive effect in the long term? And have such practices been abandoned now? So I'm not up on the management, but um, certainly aerial spraying is quite common. Um, people are doing it. I mean, I, I don't, it's not, uh, as far as I know, these practices have not been abandoned and they're not illegal. Um, but what is interesting is um, clearing trees is actually illegal. You can get fined. Um, so farmers are faced with this problem if they are going to clear, how, whether they use pesticides or not. Um, they're trying to clear woody encroachment, which is essentially bad for biodiversity, but the Biodiversity Act at present means, I mean, I think they're changing this, means that you can't clear encroachment because you shouldn't be cutting down trees and people are getting fined for clearing encroachment. Mm. Okay, thank you. Marion, I noticed your hand is up, Marion Carmen. Yes, um, I would like to say something. First of all, a big thank you to Nicola. I enjoyed the presentation very much because it's not only deep, but also broad and covering different regions of the world. And I, I quickly checked the reference to the European grassland. And I've, I've sent the, the link to the paper because I think that's um, also quite relevant to have in mind. I, I studied forestry in the last millennium and already that time we had discussions about the influence of the mega herbivores on the landscape in, in, in Eastern Africa. So it was for me a bit um, about memories as well. Um, I have two um, recommendations to, to have for, for all of you to have a look at it. Um, one is there's a novel alternative Nobel Peace Prize, which was granted to um, Tony Rinaudo, who managed to um, get some trees out of the shrublands. So I will send the link, that's a quite interesting um, approach he has. And it's of course very case sensitive. It depends on which in which country and with, with which kind of people you are working. And the other thing is I'm, I'm working for FSC. And as a German forester, I was a bit scared when I read the first time about the Namibia standard we developed or our stakeholders developed, because that's, that's about, um, from my early perspective, it was about um, taking out natural shrubs, which in the end could turn into a forest so it was, from forester perspective, the opposite of restoration of landscapes. And um, I had long discussions with my colleagues and finally I made peace with their approach. And, and for me, another strange headache is that, and, and I came over it, that this, um, um, this um, native shrubs, which are taken from the landscape, is used for, um, in the end, as um, charcoal for barbecue in Europe, which is something I, I, I hate somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only because I'm very conservative and stubborn and I do not go for barbecue because of climate change. <laughs> Instead, I fly a lot around the world. Um, so I, I will send you the link to the FSC standard for Namibia, which, yeah, um, which is also a kind of response to what um, Jill Petrovsky asked, I think. And I, I'm a bit hesitant to, to promote FSC, but in this context, I think it's, it's accepted. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you I'm, I'm really enjoying this event. Great. Thank you. Okay, Kimberly, you have a question? Yeah, um, hi, Nikki, thanks for a lovely talk. Um, I was curious about um, the, the map that you showed with the different um, rates of encroachment across the different continents. Um, and yeah, I was just curious about what, what you see as driving those differences in, in the rate of encroachment, particularly as you point out, Australia being so much lower than, than Africa and South America. So yeah, if you had, is it just about 
mega herbivores or is it other stuff going on? Um, I'd just like, yeah, to hear your thoughts. The Serrano's case is actually probably quite land management driven. I mean, there's a really active policy of fire suppression, which I think has been very profound in affecting woody encroachment in these systems. Uh, Australia seems to be with the, bi the biogeography, you know, and, and what trees are assisting in the system. Uh, it's dominated by these eucalyptus. Doesn't seem to be a lot of space for more encroachment to give you a really unscientific answer, but the, they seem to be full. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's my best example. You know, these trees are really thin, they're tall, and they occupy a lot of space and super competitive. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that you also get different rates of encouragement within Africa. And I do think that's got to do with the, the traits of the different plants. And I think some tree, plants are just better at encouraging. And if you've got a lot of them to begin with, your system's bound to be more encouraged. But I think it's also a really interesting question that we haven't really answered. Thank you. Fascinating. Okay, uh, we have a question from Alex Denton. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, great talk, thank you. And um, yeah, it was just more um, sort of your opinion, really, going back to, you know, the cultural issues and things about people thinking that, you know, replanting trees and stuff is good. And um, I just noticed on the more recent uh, David Attenborough series, where they're talking about this, um, the Great Green Wall of the South Sahara and like replanting trees. I appreciate it's uh, uh, different for different um, ecotypes and things, but I just wondered if you see any sort of issue with this kind of um, sort of really multinational approach, you know? Um, I appreciate there's lots of different scientific partners and things that are sort of informing these activities, but I wonder what's your kind of personal opinion, if there's any risk of tree species kind of spilling over into other areas and then causing an issue with woody encroachment in those. Yeah, um, so I've done some reading on the Great Green Wall and I'm really interested in it. At, at, at face value, I, I've, I find it quite, it doesn't seem to be the answer. Um, I mean, they promote planting these trees as a way to increase water into the system. I, um, I don't understand, I mean, I don't understand the argument so well for the Great Green Wall. Certainly a lot of the great the greening in the Great Green Wall is through agroforestry. And I mean, there is undeniable benefits to people's livelihoods in those systems. Um, yeah, my gut feel is I don't, I'm uneasy with it. And I feel like there's a huge amount of money that's been invested into the system, to the Green Wall very recently, actually. And so much money invested to plant trees. Um, some of the trees that are being planted are precious encroaches, but again, I don't. I haven't really spent time up there, and I'm, I don't. I'm un uneasy about it, but I I don't know enough to say more. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah, that's great. I was just wondering because um, yeah, I appreciate there's going to be lots of different sort of points of opinion and things. So thanks. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else in the audience has any more insight into the Great Green Wall. It does seem like the practice seems to be not as sort of a grand as, as the statement of this other great green wall. As you said, it seems to be, at least in some areas, it's more about community-based agroforestry and things that are more beneficial or benign than, than mass tree planting. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, I think it varies from country to country as well. Yeah, it's just because it, it, it seems to, the idea is it goes from coast to coast. So it's kind of really an all sweeping, an all sweeping thing. I just wonder how much was sort of taken into account um, yeah, when devising it. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I'll do some more reading. Yeah, it's, if you ever do come across anything interesting, feel free to email me about it because I, I'm very intrigued about it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you, Alex. Okay, Tricia, you have a question? Oh, quick question, and this might be pretty naive. Uh, I'm trying to get my head around uh, this concept of woody encroachment and mosaic sort of uh, systems where you have like an open ecosystem and like trees pretty much similar to Lope and the Western Ghats, like Sholas or Western Ghats. Is it even called like woody encroachment? Would that mean a transition to like more shrubby sort of woody uh, biomass that could still escape say the fire trap if there's a fire regime in the area? Because if it's just trees, then wouldn't that just become the forest part of the mosaic? Like I'm, yeah. <laughs> 
I, I think that a, a fun useful way to look at it is to look at the increase in forest cover. So in these mesic systems, so there's two points, like in these, in these really wet systems that are occurring adjacent to the forests, there's a trend of forests expanding into these systems. So it's not just like in mosaic and like shifting. Um, there does seem to be a clear spread of forests expanding into these systems. Um, but then also the other thing is like the woody encroaching species are actually quite distinct. Like they're actually a bit different from the system itself. So if you've got like patches of forest trees or within a grassland mosaic, if you get woody encroachment, it's not forest expansion. It's usually a shrubby acacia or a shrubby thorny plant. You know, they, 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 often the encroaches themselves have a distinct trait. Okay, great. Thank you. That Clarify my question. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Trisha. Okay, uh, Ryan, you have a question? Yeah, sorry. Just, um, yeah, back to originally when we were talking about restoration, um, there was a question um, as to what you could do to push. I'm just wondering about specifics in, I guess, herbivore, uh, specifically browser and grazer species across Africa, um, just as a case study that uh, deserve conservation effort in order to, um, in order to maintain the system? I think um, it's a, a bunch of things. I mean, having mega herbivores in the system helps. Obviously, mega it's not always possible to put a mega herbivore in the system, but to have a balance of grazers and browsers um, presence of large browsers are really important. Um, if you put a bunch of large browsers in a very wet system, they're probably not going to be very effective. So there you would want to focus your efforts on burning. So your context is quite important. I mean, I, I, can't, Bruce, I think we've sort of got to the point where we can have a loose conceptual idea of what works where and what interactions could be useful. Um, but I think we need a way to go to actually actually set a set of rules. But yeah, if your system's dry, you've probably got more options in terms of managing it through herbivory. Um, and if your system's a bit wetter, it's probably more useful to manage it by pushing up the fire and having hotter fires or more frequent fires. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, uh, Tim, you have a question? Oh, you know, no microphone. Okay, I'll read it out. Okay, uh, so you mentioned that farmers are currently fined for cutting down trees. Is this in South Africa only or in all African countries? Also, uh, you said I, you think this will be changing. Could you expand on this? Um, it's, I'm talking for South Africa. It is actually being changed because the South African government's very well aware of the problem of woody encroachment. Um, I think the examples from the Eastern Cape where some farmers cleared their land, they were fined a huge amount of money and they actually took them, the government to court. And that's being changed um, because, yeah, they recognize the impact of diversity and encroachment or encroachment on diversity. So it is being changed. I don't know what the status is at the moment. Great, thank you. Okay, does it, uh, anybody have any, any more questions? Feel free to unmute and ask them directly if anybody's got something popped into their mind. I had a question popping to my mind about um, functional ecology. Um, Nick, you just mentioned that there are sort of some traits that sort of promote um, sort of the ability of species to encroach. So what are the prominent traits? <laughs> what if we just show um, them, like, help them and also... I don't, I don't know what the traits are. Oh, sorry, carry on, finish your question. Oh, no, and then I wanted to ask what the, sort of the, tra the traits are of ecosystems that are resistant to encroachment, sort of arid, like also of grassy ecosystems, grassy arid ecosystems. Um, in terms of the traits, I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but if I'm just looking at them, often they're nitrogen fixers, um, not always, but often. Often they're multi-stem shrubs. Um, family, legume, trees belonging to the legume family are really efficient encroachers. Um, multi-stem shrub seems to be very common thread. Um, yeah. So I would I would say that that's some of some of it, but I mean then you get some exceptions like you get something called Terminalia sericea, which is 
tree and it's a single stem tree and it grows and it's a nice stem creature as well it's got no thorns it's not multi-stemmed um so I, I'm, I don't know exactly but generally you could you we could predict that if it's a, it belongs to it's if it's an acacia of course not all acacias oh sorry I should be calling them Senegalia and Bahilias not all of them are um encroachers some are but often the multi-stemmed forms are and then so your systems that are protected from encroachment. Um, I would have a hazard a guess at some of the really pristine grasslands seem to be protected from encroachment. Um, but maybe that's because the systems are a bit cooler, the high, higher, higher altitude grasslands, not that they're not climate limited, but they, they seem to be quite resistant to encroachment or limited amounts of encroachment. Arid systems, the encroachment rate is slower, but the effect is really big because tree cover is really hitting its maximum level there. Um, I actually can't think of systems that are resistant to encroachment or planned. Potentially a system where tree cover is limited by, so maybe a nutrient poor system. I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. I'm struggling to think of Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, oh, there's one from uh, Paulina who popped up. Paulina, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's Manfred. I look oh. together with Paulina um, and follows the seminar. I had a question. Um, we work in Angola in dry tropical forest ecosystems. How would you draw the line between um, savanna ecosystems, which are kind of endangered by woody encroachment and dry tropical forests, which are sensitive to deforestation. And how would you communicate this, this difference to stakeholders if you make recommendations for yeah, cutting down trees? And yeah, uh, that, that's uh, uh, communicating the difference to stakeholders uh, <laughs> sounds hard. But I mean, the often is, you know, Maybe, I mean, I don't know this, your system very well, but, you know, often these things are happening in the same place, you know, you're getting a decrease in like really tall trees and trees that are big and good for wood and fuel and building, but you're also getting, you, you're getting this pattern of encroachment at the same time. So I think the trick would be to identify the encroaching species and, you know, what you're looking for. I mean, some of the, I, I think Namibia has probably had a lot of experience in this because in some of the cl initial clearing projects, I think people got a bit too happy and cleared all the trees. Um, and I, I think there's some examples in South Africa as well where the system was completely cleared and that's not what you want either. Um, so I suppose that is the trick is to identify what an encroaching species looks like for your system. And I mean, like for Namibia, these multi-stemmed shrubby trees are common. I mean, the, the Miombo woodlands, I mean, the density of Miombo trees are increasing, um, and but you're also getting deforestation next to them. So. Yeah, okay. I was thinking in Miombo system. So yeah, thanks for the answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll ask another question. And again, uh, so you've shown that we seem to be getting a fairly good idea of the global spread of encroachment. And you made some arguments around the, the carbon benefits or disbenefits about perhaps more emissions from soil, perhaps more above ground biomass. Has there been any assessment and in all your reading of uh, the total net global carbon balance? Because I think how much of the carbon sink or carbon source could be in these encroaching open systems? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's a, I can't remember the name of the paper, but there was a paper a couple of years back that looked at some of these papers that look at global greening I mean, probably capture a lot of encroachment within these analyses. Obviously, if you're looking at greening, you're not necessarily picking up only natural systems and you're not only picking up encroachment. But I think some of those studies are picking up, you know, if you look at some of the hotspots of greening, some of them are in Southern Africa, um, and that is encroachment. And I think they are being picked up into the global carbon budgets through these remote sensing studies. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's, you know, I mean, that's quite a broad estimate because obviously some of those are 
farmlands. Um, you know, it's not only natural vegetation. Hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, any last questions from anyone? If not, uh, uh, I think we can draw, draw the event to a close. I encourage you all to uh, show your videos uh, uh, and unmute and give a round of applause to our, our speaker. It's nice to get an audible round of applause. Uh, we'll post this onto this talk onto our YouTube channel, so feel free. It should be up uh, later this evening, so feel free to share it with your colleagues and uh, other and students and others uh, that they may, may want to see it. Okay, thank you again, Nikki. Uh, thank you. And I hope everyone has a, has a good weekend, and hopefully see some of you in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nikki. Bye. Okay. <laughs>